my name's Craig Grau, and I'm from the Department of Plant Pathology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And we're out here today to begin developing a DVD for growers and other people interested in growing soybeans about the soybean cyst nematode. So soybean cyst nematode is a non-segmented roundworm. And there's a whole set of nematodes that are parasites on animals, but also on plants. There's many that are living free in the soil and are part of our soil ec ecological system and have, probably have many different benefits. But unfortunately, the soybean cyst nematode is one of many plant parasitic nematodes that can cause economic loss on crops that we're trying to grow. It being an animal, it reproduces by eggs. The soybean cyst nematode also must go through fertilization each uh, li part of its life cycle. And, and so we're dealing with an organism that lays eggs, can go through a dormant phase until there's a suitable host like soybeans and then hatch and the young larvae that emerge from the eggs infect roots and in time, if the plant is susceptible, the, the female nematode that invades the roots will start to establish a feeding site and then starts to cause a parasitic drain on the, on the physiology of the plant. Under the most severe infestations, many times 10, 20 bushels per acre is an achieved yield. I think more commonly, SZN in a situation like this is holding that, that yield plateau right around 50, sometimes the mid 40s, but you cannot get over that, that you cannot achieve the 60, 70 bushel yields that you, you might be shooting for. Versus over here, there's some argument that on certain sources of resistance, there is still some yield loss, but it's very, very minor, most likely. And so that uh, in a situation like this, we're able to grow a, a 60, 70 bushel yield when we have a adequate and effective source of resistance. Hello, my name is Sean Conley and I'm the state soybean and weed extension specialist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. What we're out here today looking at is trying to assess what type of yield loss we may occur in looking at some SCN resistant lines, specifically in some SCN sites. Um, last year, in the 2006 data at our SCN soybean site with, with the Wisconsin Soybean Variety Testing Program, we saw a 42% yield loss over all varieties from our resistant lines versus our susceptible varieties. If we only look at the elite varieties, those varieties that topped the test, we had a 49% yield loss comparing our susceptible soybean varieties to our resistant soybean varieties. Well, my name is Ann Mick Goodwin. I'm the nematologist at the University of Wisconsin and I do research uh, with soybean cyst nematodes. So I'm here today to talk about seeing SCN in the field and to tell you a little bit about the life cycle. So soybean cyst nematodes are very, very small, but one stage, the adult female, is large enough to see with the naked eye. So the most definitive way to know if you have soybean cyst nematode is to look for it on the roots. Uh, the female is about the size of the head of a pin, but the most distinctive thing is that it's a pearly white in color, and so it stands out from the root. Oftentimes people wonder, is there a particular time that they have to collect the sample? And really the most important thing is to get a sample uh, collected. And the time of year really depends on what's convenient for the producer or the person taking the sample. The nematodes live in the soil and so they're there 365 days a year. I would say that in the samples, to uh, the timeliness of it depends on when people need the information and when it's easy to collect the sample. So the most accurate diagnosis of soybean cyst nematode is to actually inspect roots of the plants themselves. And this requires a shovel because this technique of just pulling the plants out of the soil like this uh, will strip the plant of these fine lateral roots in many cases and that's where the majority of the nematodes are going to re reside on these, these lateral roots. And doing this type of action, you run a great risk of the nematode being present, but not finding it because of that sampling method. What we feel is better is to dig the plants, trying to get as deep as you can, and then 
taking the spade like this and slowly start to work the soil off the roots. And as you're doing this, keep looking at these fine roots, trying to find the either white, that, that's in the early phases, or in time they will become more of a yellow color and observe them on the roots. Always be careful not to confuse nematodes with nodules. Uh, their nodules are much, much bigger than the nematode themselves. And so rather than also at this point just pulling plants out of this, I think it's definitely best just to keep working the soil. And my experience is many times you will, this is where you'll see as you're just slowly starting to work the soil away from these roots, that's when you'll see, can see the nematode directly on the roots. So I mean, this nematode is an animal. And so when you think about a life cycle, it's got all of the stages that other animals do. It starts life as an egg. And within the egg, the juvenile develops, hatches, has to move through the soil to find a, a suitable root to enter. Uh, the nematodes go into the root, and once inside, they have to set up a specialized feeding site. And so they select cells to feed on, and rather than killing those plant cells right off, instead they, they transform those cells into kind of a feeding trough for the nematode. So that once the nematode begins to feed, it stays in place for the rest of its life, and the plant just sends nutrients to the nematode. Because of this specialized feeding arrangement that the nematode has with the plant, once it gets inside, it doesn't move again, except to move its head to continue to feed. And so as it begins to go through its life cycle, it swells in size and eventually reaches the adult female stage. By this time, her body has started to swell and it's popped through the outside of the root. So when we're digging plants and looking for soybean cyst nematode, that's what we're seeing is that body of the adult female nematode. Now there are males, but they have left the roots and are off, loose in the soil. Uh, the male and female mate, and eventually she begins to produce eggs. The first eggs are produced on the outside of her body or, are, or uh, exit the, her body, and the remainder of the eggs stay inside her body until eventually when she dies, her hardened skin uh, forms like a pouch or a bag to protect 200 to 400 eggs. And so those eggs from then on will be inside that protective cyst. And that's where we get the name soybean cyst nematode. And um, that will fall off the root and then is loose in the soil. Now that cyst and the eggs inside it can remain in place for as long as 10 years. Uh, typically, they don't last that long because every time a host plant is present, then the eggs start to hatch. The nematode is very well adapted to its host, and so it only hatches when there's a host present, or at least you get large numbers of, of nematodes hatching when a host is present. Uh, when there's not a host there, then those eggs are just sitting in a, in a quiet stage waiting uh, for a, a host plant to come along. What can happen in that interim period though is that there are predators, uh, other animals that eat the eggs, there are fungi that parasitize the eggs. So you get a decline in the population even when soybean or another suitable host isn't planted. Soybean cyst nematode live in the soil and even though they're animals they can't move very far on their own but they do manage to spread quite effectively through other means. And so we know that uh, the, the best means of spread is through equipment, any mud adhering to equipment. And so moving between fields can, can spread soybean cyst nematode. We also know that animals can spread, uh, wa uh, birds can spread soybean cyst nematode as, as well as other animals. Uh, moving water, so thinking about topography and how anything that moves soil can move soybean cyst nematode. The soybean cyst nematode is what we call an obligate parasite in the plant pathology world. And that means it requires, totally requires a living host to complete its life cycle. In contrast to many of the fungal pathogens, they, they can live outside the host and survive and even grow in many cases. But the soybean cyst nematode requiring a living host, then what we often term as host range becomes very important. In Wisconsin, soybeans are the predominant host, but also beans, dry beans, red kidney beans, snap beans, they are also host. 
So when we start talking about crop rotation, we're safest if we're talking about corn and small grains and cabbage and carrots and many of the other vegetables, but where we can get into problems if we're trying to use rotation to manage the soybean cyst nematode is that we'd have soybeans in the rotation, but also one of the beans. There's still been a lot of debate about the role of peas. At the moment, most people feel peas are, are not a good host, but being a legume, there still is this suspicion that it can support some reproduction. And so our safest rotations in the state would entail a rotation of corn, a small grain, and then soybeans somewhere in the mix. One of the important things in any type of system, be it corn or soybean, is variety selection. One of the common things that we always do is we look at a local source of data. Uh, for example, we're sitting here at the Madison West Research Farm. If we were having a variety test out here, we'd be able to identify those varieties that yield us highest at this location in 2006. If we look at the information from last year's and the past five years through the Wisconsin Variety Testing Program, what we found is there's a 50-50 chance that the high, highest yielding variety in one specific location will be the highest yielding variety over several environments. Therefore, it's critical not to only look at variety information from your specific area, but from an entire geography with many different environments. Because if we look at soybeans, for example, yield information from your farm last year only tells you how well soybeans yielded on your farm last year. That's why it's important to look at several different sources of information over several different environments, including the Wisconsin Variety Testing Program, um, company information, as well as any other sources of information, information that you can track down. Um, this is one of those areas where the more information you get, the better your choices will be. Although rotation can help us slow the increase of SCN in the field, ultimately, if the nematode is there and other conditions are favorable, it will reach economic levels. And so selecting varieties to combat SCN is still our number one control measure. There are several sources of resistance. The most used, the most common, is derived from a plant introduction, PI88788, and you will see this designation associated with many SCN resistant varieties. It is by far the most common use, use res, form of resistance. And we also have to keep in mind, we're not dealing with total resistance. On most sources of resistance, there is some reproduction. It, however, reproduction is lower and, and, to, and has a much uh, less detrimental effect on the plant. And so we're not dealing with a complete resistance. The 88788 form of resistance certainly has served us well over the years, but there seems to be an erosion in its effectiveness, not only in many parts of Iowa, Indiana, and Illinois, but also in Wisconsin. And so this means we desperately need other sources of resistance. The one that's most likely available, and probably will, you'll see an increase, is Peking, the Peking source of resistance. It's a very good source of resistance, but there have been problems in achieving high yield varieties and have this source of resistance. The one source of resistance that's probably gained the most notoriety is the Hartwig source of resistance, sometimes called Cystex. And this is the highest form of resistance that's been found. But here is a classic example of where, yes, we have this excellent source of resistance, but many of the varieties with the Cystex the Hartwig type of resistance definitely have a yield drag, a yield lag associated with them. And it's not clear just how predominant that source of resistance will become in the future. Frequently asked, what is the future of SCN in Wisconsin? And I think the first thing is, it's going to become progressively more widespread in the state. And where it is present now will most likely intensify because many growers are not growing resistant varieties or if they are, we do know there's problems with the potential problems with the PI8878 source of resistance of which it is losing some of its effectiveness. But it, it's much like many other pests, like corn rootworm, we have them, 
and I, I think we have many more options today in dealing with SCN than we did several years ago. The seed industry has moved resistance into group two, group one, now group zero, uh, maturity varieties versus 20 years ago. It was very difficult to find a good high yield group two, group one variety for our state. And so I think it's a case of awareness. It's critical that you know the, whether the cyst nematode is present on the acres that you're farming. Don't just think it can't happen to me. I don't see obvious symptoms. It's very, very important to sample or have get seek help, get help in, in making sure that you do not have this nematode, but if you do, where it is, how many. And the, again, the Wisconsin Soybean Marketing Board is sponsoring a free soil sampling program, and this is your checkoff dollars in action. Do not let this opportunity pass by. Get your acres tested to see where you're at. Information on SCN is very plentiful. And I think there are multiple sources ranging from your seed company representatives all the way to your state university, University of Wisconsin-Madison. We have several uh, websites of, that have information on SCN and also the North Central Research Program sponsored Plant Health Initiative is a very good source for information on SCN. The Wisconsin Soybean Marketing Board has funded the Soybean Health website for several years and it can be used to directly obtain information about SCN or it's linked extensively to other states and I think it's always good to see what's being said in other states because in some cases your situation uh, might fit their information better than some of ours. Sei que você vai gostar de estar no meio.